In this first section of chapter one, we will discuss initial value problems, which basically will be an ordinary differential equation and an initial condition. We're going to explain this in a few minutes, actually in the next video. In this video, what we will do is see how we can use ODEs and soon initial value problems to model reality. So let's start with a pretty standard uh, example, which is a pendulum. And here is a um, video of a pendulum. And I would like to thank Stephen Troy for allowing uh, me to use this video in this, uh, in, in this, in this video. Um, so we have a pendulum here and you see what happens when you release the pendulum, it oscillates. Okay. Now, what you would like to do, uh, that's a very simple physics mechanics uh, question, is to model the behavior of this system. And to do so, what you will do is use uh, Newton uh, physics uh, mechanics. What you have is, uh, well, a, a rod, and at the end of the rod you have a bob. Uh, the bob has a mass which will be denoted by small m. The rod has length which will be denoted l. And, well, the angle of the pendulum, which is the unknown and which will vary uh, with time, is theta of t. Now, we need to make some uh, modeling hypothesis. Uh, what we will uh, assume is that the behavior of the system is marginally impacted by the weight of the road. So basically, that, 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 um, that, that rod of length L you know, you don't, you don't, you don't really consider it. I mean, you consider it because it attaches the, the, the bob, but I mean, you don't consider its weight. And then you don't consider the interaction with the air or any friction. Basically, all you look at is, uh, well, the, the mechanics of that bob. And if you do this, then you're interested in the speed of the bob, which will be L times theta prime. Theta prime is the angular velocity of the bob and its acceleration, which will be L theta second. And, and that takes place in the tangential direction. Now, the, the Earth will attract uh, that bob. So there is a gravitational force that can be decomposed in two parts. Uh, the first part is the radial component, which will have a norm, which will be, well, F times cosine theta. F is mg, it's uh, the mass of the bob, times g the gravitation uh, and ft is the tangential component so that will be fr i mean the, the norm will be fr and that will be mg sine theta now fr will be exactly balanced by the force exerted by the string or by the, the by the by this by this rod uh, and so therefore there will be nothing really of interest on that uh, particular radial component. What will be of interest will be what happens in the tangential component because this is what will produce the motion. So what we will have is thanks to Newton's second law that ML theta second, which is the acceleration, uh, will be, I mean M times the acceleration, is minus mg sine theta. And since the bob is uh, as a mass which is not zero, then we can simplify by m and obtain that theta second is equal to minus g over l time sine theta. Now, that is a second order ordinary differential equation. As, as you can see, uh, there will be several solutions, obviously, because until I specify what is the position of the bob and what is its initial velocity, then, uh, well, obviously I will have several possibilities, right? So, but once I set the value of theta of zero and of theta prime of zero, then that will give me a unique solution. So that is the ODE. And if I want a unique solution, I will have to add something and that will be called an initial condition. Okay, so that is a First example, as you can see, uh, ODEs can be used to model this kind of systems, which I'm sure you already knew because you did mechanics before. I just wanted to recall that particular uh, situation. Now, let me give you a second example. Uh, if you model the evolution of two species, predators and prey, uh, then X will be the amount of prey, Y will be the amount of predators, 
And what you can do as a model, and that will be called Locta Volterra, is assume that the prey have unlimited full supply. The birth rate of the prey is proportional to the amount of prey, right? The more prey you have, the more they will reproduce. Now, the rate of predation upon which the prey uh, will be eaten by the predator will be proportional to the rate at which the predator and the prey meet. And which, which makes sense from a modeling point of view. And you, you, you say, okay, well, this is since it's proportional, I will have a coefficient that will be called beta. So the variation of the prey uh, will be alpha times x, that's the birth rate, uh, minus uh, beta times xy, the you know, meeting of the prey and the predators. Now, what we will say then is that x prime is alpha x minus beta x y. Now, if you look at the predators, well, they will have unlimited appetite, uh, and the birth rate of the predators will be proportional to the amount of predators and the amount of food available. So again, you get a proportional uh, coefficient here, a proportionality coefficient delta. Now, the mortality rate of the predators obviously is proportional to uh, the predator's population. The more predators you have, the more predators die. And what you obtain is a variation y prime, which is delta xy minus uh, gamma y. Now, when you put all of these two equations together, here's what you get. You get a system. You get basically a first order ODE, but you can see that it's not taking its values in R, it's taking values in R2. So that will be vectorial, if you prefer. So the unknown U will be an application from T to R2, so D will be equal to, to 2, that will be dimension of the space, and the ODE, the first order ODE, will be U prime equals F of U, and here is the function f that we consider. Let me give you a third example. Third example will be chemistry. And here is a reaction that is pretty surprising. Uh, it is an oscillating reaction. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, the, 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 basically uh, the, 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 the solution changes color. I mean, what's inside of the bucket here uh, keeps changing color and going back to the same color uh, several times. So that is called the briggs rauscher reaction, and I would like to give uh, credit to Maxim Betilovsky for uh, actually making this video. Thank you very much, and thank you for putting it in a, uh, a license that allows people to use it. Now, uh, what we would be interested in doing is to actually understand why uh, this uh, reaction is doing this? Why is it doing so? And once again, you can use ODEs, ordinary differential equations, to figure it out, to actually to model it and try to understand why it does so. So there are a few chemicals uh, involved in this reaction. So uh, I'm not a chemist, but I understand that there are quite a few of these, uh, of these uh, chemical compounds. What I do know, though, is that the law of mass action says the rate of a chemical reaction is proportional to the concentration of the reacting substances. And by using this, then that what, what it will mean is that, uh, for instance, if I look at the reaction between the H2O2 and the HOI, then it will be provided as the time derivative of the um, concentration of H2O2 will be a constant uh, times the product of the concentration of HOI and H2O2, right? Where the, well, that coefficient is just a coefficient, right? It's, it's a constant, all right? So if you put all of these uh, compounds, basically you got all the equations that you know, transform the compounds into one another, then here is what you get. Uh, and make sure you know all of this for the quiz. Uh, it's really important that you know this by heart, of course. Um, then you have uh, 11 equations. So that is an ODE, a first order ODE uh, in um, the space R11. And what you can do is, um, well, you know, like Volta Volterra, try to understand how uh, this actually oscillates. And, well, most likely you won't do this by hand. You will have to use a computer to kind of simulate it but then you can actually 
hopefully understand why this uh, chemical reaction is doing what it does. So you see so far I gave you a, an example that comes from mechanics, an example that comes from basically trying to model a species, and now a, something that can model uh, chemistry. I could, uh, you know, give you fourth, fifth, sixth example, I mean, on very, very many, in very, very many uh, different um, um, fields. I'll just give you a fourth one, and then we'll, we'll call it a day, uh, and that will be a, the Silo Swan model, which is an economic model that you will actually uh, discuss next year in the economy class. Well, uh, it tries to explain, to explain uh, the economic growth. So, of course, it's a model. I mean, you know, we're not saying that reality is a model. It's a model. Uh, and basically, we have the capital. That's K of T, available at time T. We have the depreciation of the capital. I mean, you know, basically your building is depreciating, your computer is depreciating, your car is depreciating. So, your capital is depreciating. Uh, on the other hand, you have the labor force, which is available at time t, and the technological progress and also the productivity uh, increase of the, the labor force. So what you will have is that the production, the yield uh, at time t, will be, uh, first of all, it's a fraction, uh, a fraction is saved, thus reinvested in capital, and a fraction, uh, the, the rest of it, is being consumed. So. There are several ways to model this. Usually, we decide on the Cobb-Douglas model to give y from k and l. So there is another parameter, which is alpha, which is being used. What you have is that the yield is k raised to power alpha, l power 1 minus alpha. Okay? Now, uh, obviously, from uh, the uh, increase of productivity and technical progress, we have l prime of t which is n times L of t. And when it comes to the capital, well, you have the capital that will depreciate, so that's a minus delta k, but also the fraction which is saved, thus reinvested in capital. So that's why you have this fraction s multiplied by the yield y. And when you put all of this together, guess what you obtain? You obtain an OD of first order, dimension 3, which is basically given here. So again, you see uh, ODEs will actually allow you to model a wide variety of situations, provided, of course, you have only one variable with respect to which you differentiate. You see, I mean, at this point, it's time, so there is only one uh, variable, but if there were more than one variable, then you would not have an ODE, you would have what we'll call a PDE, and we'll obviously discuss this later in this PDE class. Uh, Another remark, which I already made, but I'm going to make it again. Obviously, if you don't know what is L of 0, K of 0, and Y of 0, you won't be able to predict what will be L, K, and Y later on. You need this initial condition that will actually is, uh, well, the situation, the state of uh, the, the system at a given time, and then the ODE really models the way it evolves. So, Really, what you want is the state of a system at a given time, and that will be called the initial condition, and the ODE that will model the way it evolves uh, over time. Now, there is one more thing we need to do. Um, in, this, in, this ex in these examples, I mean, we have, well, for instance, here the capital is probably in, in euros or in dollars or in some kind of currency. Uh, the earlier the, 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 uh, the, the chemical reactions were concentration. So, so obviously we, we have units. Um, I would like to talk about non-dimensionalization and the easiest way to explain it is to go back to the first example, which was the pendulum. So if you remember, we wrote that theta second is minus g over L times sine theta. Now, these variables have a dimension, right? For instance, L is a length. It is a physical quantity. What, it's, what, what we're saying will have a unit, which will be called, which, for instance, is the meter. It could be inches, it could be feet, it could be, well, usually in the international system, we, we like to use the meter, uh, which represents a predetermined length, right? We actually have this, this meter 
uh, well, actually, um, now the meter is no longer um, uh, represented by this by this rod. But I mean, the originally we had a rod um, not far away from here. I mean, at the Pavillon de Breteuil. I mean, which was really in the outskirts of Paris, where it was exactly one meter. That 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 length which was um, basically decided during the French Revolution, uh, or right after it, uh, was 10th millionth of the length of a quadrant uh, along the Earth meridian, as we thought it was. Obviously, we did not have very um, accurate ways to, to, to measure this, but whatever it was, I mean, that, that was a, a predetermined set uh, a, 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 a length that was predetermined, right? And when I'm saying it's three meters, I'm saying it's three times this quantity, right? This is what I, this is what I'm saying. So you see, we have a unit. It's not a number. It's really a number times uh, something. It's, it's a unit. Okay. Now in the equation, what are the units that are coming into play? The angle. The unit is radiant. Uh, the angular speed. So that will be radiant per second. The angular acceleration. That will be radiant per second square. Uh, obviously, g, which is an acceleration, that's a meter per second square, uh, and the length, which is uh, with the unit, is a meter. Right? We could change the unit, we could have other units, but we'll still have a unit of length, a unit of acceleration, and so on, so forth. Now, what we need to do, from a mathematical point of view, is to replace these dimensional variables with a dimensional variables, okay? And this process is called scaling or it's called non-dimensionalization. For instance, uh, well, I have L, which is a length. I will say, let me take lambda, which, was, which is one meter. Then L will be L star times lambda. And now L star has no dimension. All the dimension is inside lambda. Okay? Same thing with g. g will be uh, 1 meter per second square, so small g will be small g star times capital G. Same thing with the time. Capital T will be 1 second, so t will be t star times capital T. And by the way, we have a time derivative, so we'll need to, well, basically do the chain rule, and we can see that dt is 1 over t, d I mean, d over dt is 1 over t times d over dt star. Uh, then we have the radiant, uh, the measure of the angle. Now, this is a little special here because actually the radiant is, is, is actually not a unit per se. I mean, I won't get into the details too much, but uh, basically what you can say is that the, the, if, if you look at an angle, the angle theta is the ratio of the length of L, right? I mean, you, you look at the angle and you see how it intersects the, 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 the circle. Well, there is a length of the perimeter of the circle, uh, that's L, and then there is the radius of the circle, that's R, and basically the angle is simply L over R. So it's meters over meters, or basically unit of length over unit of length, that's basically A-dimensional. So Really, the radiant is just here to remind us that it is an angle, there is an angle, but really, you know, if, if you really think about it, it's, there, there is no unit. Uh, and so, so, so when there is radiant per second, really what we could say is hertz. It's really one over second, but just, it would confuse people. So just as a convenience, we just say radiant per second, where we could just say second, uh, second negative one, right? Uh, in any case, what I'm saying is, uh, basically, theta is equal to theta star. That is already non. There is basically no dimension on on on, on, on theta. So. When I have all of this, I can go back to my equation, which again was theta second equals minus g over L sine theta, and I can replace all of this uh, theta and g and L and whatnot by, uh, well, by basically what, what, what I just uh, put over there, and then what I end up with is theta star second equals a coefficient minus g t square over lambda, which, by the way, if you look at the dimension of this, that should be non-dimensionalized, uh, times g star over l star sine theta star. So, so this is not, there is no dimension on this equation, okay? 
Now, of course, uh, rather than carrying the stars uh, everywhere, we'll just drop the stars for the sake of simplicity and just say, okay, well, you know, we, we just, we just, you know, just, it's just easier this way. We just need to remember that we have this conversion table somewhere. So here is for non-dimensionalization, and here were for a few examples of how we can use ODEs and IVP, which we will define in a few seconds, uh, to model system. So now we're going to get into more details about the initial value problem and see a few theorems that will allow us to analyze these IVPs. That is coming up in the next video.